Now, Lowell put together the series without asking me. <laughs> and when I see my name at the end of it, I say, okay, what am I supposed to talk about? Augustine? I'd be, I'd be real simple. Genesis. Well, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I can handle that. But how do you put those kinds of information, understanding, in a series on science. And my background is I began at Villanova in 1959 as a physics major. So I ought to know something about science, but of course I've left a lot of that stuff behind. Um, but I at least come to it with, with, um, my, with a lively interest, even though I haven't kept up with the field. And although I didn't get to every single one of the lectures, I did get to more than half. And so I think I kind of sense how people went along with this. So what I've, what I've done is I'm, I'm kind of a neophyte when it comes to PowerPoint. Um, so please don't laugh too hard. But you know it, it looks more or less professional to begin with. And it's um, going to be my outline. Um, so we spent the semester, the year, Strolling through time. Um, it seemed to me that what Lowell did was really ask professors on campus and even a couple from off campus um, to put their research together, to put their heads together. And in, in other words, to live up, the be live up to the best of what Villanova is really all about. Making sure that we don't have a scientific way of knowing and a, a um, a literary way of knowing or you know that somehow it's the human person who counts it's the human person who knows and that really ought to be our focus um, so I couldn't really begin without a word of thanks to you for putting this series together it has in fact been stimulating um, and aided perhaps in this new part of the year um, by the discovery of gravitational waves and being able to even um, begin to verify that there is such a thing. And when I first saw the, the news report, I said, wait a minute, what, how does this relate to the Big Bang? And going back and, uh, and reading that this is really that which led up to the Big Bang. In other words, all the things that we thought we knew, that we had at least a reasonable theory about, that we lumped under the language of Big Bang theory, somebody said, there's more. And we need to understand something more than just the, um, the accepted or unacceptable theory uh, of our time. And so it seemed to me right to put on the first page the sense of mystery. Mystery which has always been important for Christian thinkers, um, but is no less important for scientific thinkers. Because there's always going to be more to learn. Um, so that's kind of like the beginning page. Then I have three questions. Why Genesis? Why Augustine? Why me? <laughs> seemed like a logical way to go. Uh, the, um, the language of Genesis, I think we can all agree it was not an eyewitness account. Doesn't pretend to be an eyewitness account. So the in the beginning is what? A flight of imagination? A bit of faith? or just a good way to begin a book? How much did the writer and the revisers and eventually the, the, the people who put it on paper and passed it on, how much did they really know was caught up in those words in the beginning? Because they certainly weren't all engaged, they weren't deeply engaged in philosophical thinking. And I think most scholars will agree that the theological motivation 
for the writing down of the book of Genesis, chapter 1, was not to describe, as it were, from the point of view of God, exactly how things came to be. But it was to provide a framework so that everyone would respect the Lord's Day, the Sabbath. Because on that day, God rested. And therefore, we ought to rest. And by associating this, the, the structure of the week, the structure of human life, with the action of God, the writer, in fact, is much less concerned about the origins of the universe than we are. At least that is my understanding. Um, and he says, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland. What is the to'u ba'u? Formless. Does that mean that God took matter already existing and gave it shape? Because if, you, if we stopped with the first verse of the first chapter of Genesis, that's a perfectly reasonable uh, conclusion. And Greek writers later, even within the Christian tradition, would struggle with such thoughts. Because they are coming not just with the sense of the faith in the God who created, but with a sense of well, what came first, or how did it happen? Um, and the language of creation from nothing is not original language from the Bible. That ends up being something that develops as the Hebrew traditions find themselves caught up in Greek culture and having to answer the questions that are being asked by um, refined philosophers. So did God just give form to formless matter? A question that Augustine will have to answer, but which the writer of the book of Genesis did not answer. Now, you can go to the prophet Isaiah, to various Psalms, and say that with a word, God formed the universe. He spoke, and it was made. Much less question about whether or not there was something beforehand, because the word is the first thing that happens. So it's good not to leave the first chapter of Genesis isolated from the rest of the Old Testament. Because even the Jews, at least by the time we move into the Christian era, are, are struggling with and debating the question of how it all began. Augustine will use, Augustine and the people of his time, but especially Augustine, will use the word literal, not as at face value, but as related to the intention of the author. So asking the author of Genesis, why did you do this? Why did you write this? What was this all about? And to do so in successive chapters, depending upon which hand might have been behind that particular part of the book of Genesis. So when Augustine writes a literal commentary on the book of Genesis, it's not take everything superficially. It's get into what this was all about for those who produced the text, lived the text, believed in the text. based on their experience within time, how does anyone think about the world without also thinking about time? So the putting together, the writing of the book of Genesis doesn't pretend to answer questions about the Big Bang or even cosmic inflation. <laughs> 
it simply pretends to say something about how God is related to and might even be part of time. Why Augustine? Augustine was a Manichae for a while. And the Manichaeans had all sorts of theories about how this all happened. And their theories depended upon the fact that there was a fight in the heavens between good and evil, between the good God and the bad God. And for a long time, Augustine was caught up in that until, and even after, he was challenged by his friend Nebridius, who said, well, what's this thing about a fight? What if God didn't want to fight? And troubled by the question, because all of a sudden, the Manichaean need for a fight to explain how good separated from evil and how they're related or not related it just goes away. But he was fascinated by the story of Genesis because when he finally came to accept that this was an understanding that replaced, undermined, um, outdid anything the Manichees had ever said, he writes first a book on Genesis against the Manichees. Then he tries his hand at writing a long commentary. Kind of gives up that up before too long. Then at the end of the Confessions, he writes three chapters on the first two, seems like on the first two verses of Genesis. A little more than that, but three, part, three books of the Confessions are all about this. And then, then he writes the long, literal commentary of Genesis. Takes him years to do that. And in the process, he has some words in his writing on the city of God, which also deal with uh, the creation narrative. We always celebrate birthdays as human beings. We like to pay attention to origins because we're human beings. And there's nothing unusual at being fascinated, whether one is a theologian, a believer, a non-believer, a scientist, a whatever. There's not only nothing wrong with being fascinated by beginnings, but that seems to be a very a, a deep part of who we are, and it was a part of who Augustine was. So he affirms a Christian vis vision of the universe. But Augustine tries to make sure that there's no fight between faith and observation or science. I use the word observation because science in those days, scientia would just be knowledge. And in our day, the word science has, takes on all sorts of other meaning. So Augustine wanted to make sure that truth was one. Not a scientific truth and a faith truth that we can fight. So he will say to the scientist or to the natural science person of his time, you know, well, if you come up with a theory that you can show is true, I will show you how the Bible agrees. Not, I'm going to use the Bible to pound you into submission. He's willing to give away the store, as it were, because he knows truth is one. And so the, the challenge, even our, in our own day, is not to kind of use the text of the Bible as a way to enter into a scientific discussion, so much as to get to the intention of one and the other so that they are mutually enriching. And the truth that comes out of it is bigger, closer to the whole truth, and much more interesting than getting caught in the laboratory or caught between the pages of a book. His voice today is sought out, in, in my estimation, 
Augustine is always read in a more intense way in times that change. So Protestant Reformation, Calvin said, Augustine is ours. Luther said, no, Augustine is ours. Catholics said, no, he's ours. And nobody was right. He's all of ours. Because in some ways he cuts across some of the denominational and confessional differences. And again and again, rather than turn to the, the hardened categories of Thomistic ontology, people find, and Galileo found, that Augustine's understanding of Genesis was much more interesting than Thomas's. Because Augustine respected the text in ways that Thomas did not. And Augustine's approach to an understanding of the text was what others have called in the meantime, hermeneutically more sophisticated. Now that was not a slap at Thomas. I don't need to put Thomas down to build Augustine up. But in the area of Genesis, Augustine has more to say. In the, in the area of systematic theology, Thomas has more to say. Let's give each their due and, and let them have their voice. Um, so Augustine's searching of the heart, let me know myself, and searching of the scripture, let me know you, always went together. And somehow or another, his desire for truth was such that he didn't care where the truth came from. Didn't matter whether you were his worst enemy. If you said something true, he was interested. And if you said something true, he was going to build on that to show you how the rest of what you're saying is wrong if you're his enemy. I would not have wanted to be a debater with him on that. Why me? Much quicker. Um, I've got an office on campus called the August Indian Institute. My job is in some ways to try to make sure that wherever possible, the name, the idea, the understandings of Augustine are part of, are somehow underneath or filtered into the things that people do. Um, so every semester I offer something called the Vivian J. Lamb Lecture Series on Augustinian thought and the sciences. And so we try to bring in a, a scientist from outside campus and I've found that the participation in those lectures has been going down and down and down. So I said, we've got to change this. So in the fall, there's going to be a team taught course on science and humanity. And those professors are going to choose the, the lecturer so that the lecturer will have at least one class present at the lecture. But it seems to me that that will give a little bit more life to the connection between the College of Arts and the College of Sciences so that the and holds them together rather than distinguishes them one from the other. That's the long-term vision. Um, as I say, I began at Villanova as a physicist. I didn't get very far. Um, my old physics teacher actually was the one who said, when are you going to be an Augustinian? I hadn't thought of it. I said, I don't know. One of these days, maybe. And a few days later, I put in my name which is really strange. Um, my interest is in the fourth century. When I taught in Rome for a dozen years, my, the course that I taught for most of those years was called the fourth century. And so names like Ambrose and Augustine, people who were not scientists, but who had a huge respect for human knowledge, human knowing. Um, so in some ways to try to bring together this interest is interest in the sciences, interest in history, um, reputation of some of the major figures of our Christian tradition, Ambrose and Augustine. So as Lowell said, who better? Well, I'm sure there's somebody better, but I just happen to be available. Um, I was fascinated in reading a book on Einstein and Picasso that much of what led up to Einstein's theory of general rel relativity 
if not all of it, happened outside of the laboratory. The experiments happened in the mind. Augustine would call that in his time the exercise of the mind, exercitatio mentis, the willingness to grab a topic, question it, and question it, and question it in new ways, adding a piece, taking off a piece, keeping the questions going in the hope of getting some kind of a solution. So he did that in the Confessions with regard to memory, with regard to time. Um, not as a way of either trying to analyze memory or analyze time, but to figure out how is my memory related to God? How is my time related to eternity? And so in a, in a sense, this experimentation that we see more and more clearly through all of the theories of quantum mechanics, quantum physics, quantum whatever, um, that we see very clearly in the um, experimentation done to, um, what was it called, cosmic inflation. You know, trying to verify, how would you even know to look or even be interested in asking what led up to the Big Bang if you didn't use your imagination? If the mind wasn't working overtime to try to get in between the things that people are saying, the things that we see, so that we might go beyond that which is physically available and deal with something distant in time, distant in space, and unapproachable in any laboratory without coming up with what is it that I'm trying to find? then I can design an experiment to try to figure out whether or not my theory works. And that's what science does very well. That's what Augustine did all the time. It's just that he was doing it more with the soul than he was with the universe. So, um, Genesis, I think it's important to say, is not a set of cliff notes about the universe. And that's one of the things that Augustine found important. Genesis did not tell him what he was seeing. He didn't need Genesis to replace his eyes, his feel, his, his um, interaction with people about the world. Genesis told him something about God and about God's relationship to the world, to creation. I think, and Jonathan will probably be able to confirm or expand, but one of the key texts for Augustine is Romans 120. Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived. I mean, it's not so much Genesis that was at the, at the root of his thinking about the universe. It's that little phrase from Paul. Because it meant I have to look again and again at the things that are around me, at the people, at the experiences, at whatever it is. So the exercise of the mind on how to put together the things that I see, the things that, that philosophers say, the, the things that natural philosophers are, are eloquent in, those things are there not so that I can tell you how the universe began, because I believe that it was created. And as soon as the language of creation is used, now, you and I, but even in Augustine's time, not a lot before him, um, it was creation from nothing that was presumed. And so Augustine's understanding of creation was that it was instantaneous. It happened at the word of God. 
And with the beginning of the creation of things was also the beginning of time. So you'd think that when somebody said, what was God doing before he made heaven and earth? And when he quotes the passage, he says, you know, he says, I could answer this the way I've heard other people say. He was making hell for people to think like you do. He says, but no, no, no. I'm going to treat the question as a real question. Even though it was a silly question, we might say from now, the questioner deserves respect. And so even in those sets of circumstances, he says, don't ridicule the questioner who, by saying such and such. In the beginning refers also to the beginning of time. There was no before. Therefore, the question doesn't make sense because there was no time. And that's a more interesting answer. Because instead of simply winning the argument, he moves the discussion forward. So he says in that same place, I boldly assert, before God made heaven and earth, he wasn't doing anything. He just was. There's a huge tendency among critics and lovers of Augustine to mine his works for the answers. And one of the most important questions that's never asked, well, almost never, what, did he, what is it that he said he did not know? How often did he trace the limits of his own knowledge? So for example, pretty important to know about the origin of the soul, right? And there were four theories in his time. Two of them presumed a pre-existence of the soul. Well, that wasn't going to work um, because there was no time within which or place within which souls might pre-exist. But the other two, named more or less traducinus, that is, direct line from um, parents, making the parents in some ways co-creators, um, or creationist, where it's the word of God. And he could never decide. And he goes on and on at his <coughs> um, insistence that he didn't know. Because if he chose one, he had this set of problems. If he chose the other, he had that set of problems. And so something as crucial as the origin of the soul ends up being something that he has no answer to. Something as crucial as the, as the fate of the unbaptized infant. He doesn't know. And he says, the logic says that everybody to be saved has to be baptized by water and the Spirit. John's Gospel says it explicitly. How could they possibly be saved? And yet, that's a really bad understanding of things. I don't know. So here's the logic, but here's the problem. And what's important there is that if we, characterize Augustine, if we characterize Augustine as the thinker who knows everything, and we go reading, and we, it's so easy to pull some of his theories apart. Well, maybe not all that easy, but people do it all the time, from original sin to origin of soul to um, the, the fate of infants, and on and on and on. He's a pessimist, doesn't work. But if we give him we take him at his word. There's stuff I don't know. So join with me in the discovery process. That's a much more interesting Augustine. 
and there's, there's much more to come out of taking Augustine in that way than simply classifying him here or there on a given issue, as too often scholars have done. So Augustine wants to name the mystery in the same way that a scientist, if he wishes to solve the problem, has to name what the problem is. I want to know what happened before. How, where did the energy come from for a Big Bang to happen to begin with? Because if you name the mystery, then it tends to be something that will embrace others in the process of discovering and respecting more about the mystery that will nonetheless remain. And so he quotes often Romans 11, 33, um, the inscrutable plan of God, especially, so go through his works, find where he cites that passage, and then read back to say, what is he saying he doesn't understand? Lots of stuff he doesn't understand. But he goes on to say, just keep at it. Don't give up. So Augustine's interest is the truth about which Genesis spoke. Why was it written? Why does it matter? Creation from nothing um, was more than just giving form to some pre-existing matter. Creation began before Genesis. Nobody ever talks about the creation of the angels. I forget which book it is. Is a book um, 11 of uh, the City of God. One of the books of the City of God on and on about the creation of the angels. Well, that's not even in Genesis. And it does matter. Because if something was created before the creation of the universe as we know it, was that when time began? Or are they so spiritual that they didn't need time? What are we going to do with that? Naming the mystery gets us out of the bind of having to confront religion and science as if they are opposing factors. And he also, within his study of the book of Genesis, especially in um, books 11, 12, 13 of the, of, uh, the Confessions, he wants to figure out, well, how is the Trinity, not just God, but God as Father, Son, and Spirit, part of the process of creation? And that's not a scientific question in modern terms. That's a religious question. But that ends up being his focus. So a long quote. What does it matter to me that various interpretations of these words are proffered as long as they're true? Provided, therefore, that each person tries to ascertain in the scriptures the meaning the author intended, what harm is there if a reader holds an opinion which you, God, show to be true, even though it is not what was intended by the author, who himself meant something true, but not exactly that? So it's not even you can have one interpretation and I can have another. It's the author may have had one interpretation, but we can take it in a different way too, even though that wasn't his intention. But we need to know, what was the author's intention? And as long as, as the, the resulting conclusion is done by people of um, um, good intention, honest searching, well, there are lots of things that can be said on the basis of the biblical text that are all true. And we could even fight about them without having to fight about the truth, which is kind of nice. The theory of, the, of intelligent design, hogwash. Um, because if you look at how that so-called theory of intelligent design began, it's perfectly obvious that they only came up with the language 
because they were trying to fight against evolution. It has little to do with the Bible, and it has less to do with science, and it's all a public relations ploy. And it doesn't help them in any conversation they might have about biological or physical or whatever kind of evolution we might be talking about. So Augustine science, six days, not literal history. Periods of time, always undefined. Um, and he knew, I mean, if, if the sun wasn't created until the fourth day, there's something wrong here. This doesn't quite work as a definition of how things happened. Um, so natural science helps to determine the meaning of the word of God. But both natural science and the word of God are part of a larger truth. Augustine has something called seminal reasons, rationes seminales. Um, I'm not sure that any scientist today studying the works of Augustine would ever agree that seminal reasons are in fact the same as the theory of evolution. They're really different things. But if God created everything all at once, and put within things the ability to, in fact, evolve. Even though Augustine doesn't say anything of the, of the, the jump from one species to another, I meaning he has no understanding of biological evolution, he has left us with a, um, he has left open the possibility of evolution as part of a, of a rational, cogent theology. Conclusion. How long did I go? Human beings have the power to question so that by understanding the things you have made, they may glimpse the unseen things of God. Beauty speaks to all, but only they understand who test the voice heard outwardly against the truth within. So affirming scripture and science at the same time gives each its rightful role, and the search does end up being open-ended. Thank you.